Love, joy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text from 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul writes, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. That's the text. For thousands of years, God's people have knelt before his altar to encounter him. They've come to sacrifice to lay down some significant things and worship to him, and they've come also to receive from God his goodness and his grace. So in the last three weeks, we've been taking you to the altar of God in this series called Altar Ego, using the obvious play on words. Our goal in the series was simply to take our egos, who we think we are, and lay them down so that we can become who God says we are. So, so far we've laid down our feelings of inadequacy. So many of you are so troubled by your past, the things that you've done in life that in your mind so obviously would keep God from ever loving someone like you. So you become paralyzed by your past, trapped in feelings of inadequacy. But the good news is that you do not have to let your failures define you. If you don't like who you've been, you don't have to keep being that person forever. You can kneel down at the altar of God in repentance and literally alter your past. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness and leave uh, the rest of it for us to take care of. See where it said that? Were you following? Were you tracking? All right, I got to make sure this laser is working here. Could you read it together, this, this last part? Will forgive us our sins and purify us from all of it. Not part of it. All of it. A new slate, a fresh life, a forgiven life in Christ. In the second week of the series, we laid down our need for control, or at least we tried to, you know, some of us control freaks, uh, you know, that's pretty hard to let God be God when we're very busy trying to be Him ourselves. So instead of letting our egos edge God out, we dedicated ourselves to trust in the Lord with some of our hearts. Stay with me. Trust in the Lord with all of our hearts to lean not on our own understanding in some of our ways, in all of our ways to acknowledge Him knowing that He will make our paths straight. Last week we laid down our right to be offended and that is a huge one today. We want to get mercy from others but it seems that we're not so willing to extend that mercy to them. And so we become trapped in a vicious cycle of, of someone who took offense and then gave offense to take offense and get offended. And, and all we need, folks, is for one of us to just lay that down, to stop being offended, to be the first one who follows the advice of God, actually the command of God to be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And when you do that, God can accomplish some amazing things in your damaged relationships. So finally today we come to another big one that we need to alter if we're going to be the person or become the person God wants you to be. In order to have an altered, altered ego, you need to lay down your longing for approval. Our need to please that can literally become a disease. Another message I've turned to some of our superheroes to have an alter ego illustration. So I thought I'd use one more. This one's more modern, kind of an offbeat superhero. I'm sure many of you have seen. Drop it. Uh, hey. I don't 
Drop it now! Hey, cool man. No problem. No problem at all. How do you know about this? I don't even know what that is. I'm just a junker, man. I was just just check us hey, out. You don't look like a junker. You're wearing rabbit of God. It's a, just an outfit, man. The Ninja Turtle, you better stop poking me. What is your name? My name is Peter Quill, okay? Dude, chill out. Move! Why? Ronan may have questions for you. Hey, you know what? There's another name you might know me by. Star Lord. Who? Star Lord, man. Legendary outlaw. Guys, move! I forget this. <laughs> Even Star Lords have a longing for approval, and if you've seen that, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy kind of kind of has a tough time getting that Star Lord thing to stick and get approval from people, and he kind of wants it. But folks, it often gets us into trouble. As we even get to the point of compromising what we know God wants us to be in order to try to be what others want us to be or what we think they want. And so today we're going to lay that down. We're going to allow God to alter our egos in that area so we don't get corrupted by that desire to please. And is that okay with you guys? Because I've spent a lot of time working on that. Will, will that be okay? Do you approve? Do you like it? Do you like me? You like me? You know, I got to be honest with you. Really, as I prepare a message week after week to deliver from this pulpit to God's people, my sinful, selfish ego wrestles with that need to please with my desire for you to like me instead of leading you to love God. Some of you know I am the last of eight kids in my family who all went to college, who all did good things. You don't think that maybe there was a need for myself somehow to be recognized in the midst of all of those other brothers and sisters? You know, today we're, and, and Luke and I talk about it all the time because, you know, just reality, sports is big in our community, sports is big in our congregation, we've got weekend tournament activities, club sports, how can we, you know, make a difference? We're talking about maybe writing devotions that you can take with you, uh, you know, when you go along with your kids and, and watch their sporting events. Somehow we need to continue to impact people for Christ. Uh, we understand that a lot of folks aren't going to be here every Sunday. But I just want to tell you, you know, back in the day, back in my day, I literally don't ever remember my dad being at a single sporting event of mine. It's not that he was a bad dad. He had other things that literally were often more important. Now I, and I, I can just... What? How can you say it? Because it's so important that we make it to every one of the events of our kids today. It's, it's a, it, literally, there was a different understanding back in that day. Nevertheless, you don't think that motivated me even more to try and win my father's approval? Wasn't a bad dad, but I'm just telling you there are some things in my background, personally, that make it very difficult for me to lay down my need to please, my longing for approval. That's why I love uh, Martin Luther's sacristy prayer. I've mentioned this before. I have it right up here in the pulpit. The sacristy is a, a little place uh, next to the front of the church, like that little room over there where the pastor would typically hang out and prepare to greet the people and then come out and lead worship. And I just want you to know that Long before any of you are in the building on a Sunday morning, every Sunday morning that I'm here for the last 21 years, I have prayed this prayer sometimes several times. Lord God, thou hast made me a pastor and teacher in the church. Thou seest how unfit I am to administer rightly this great and responsible office. And had I been without thy aid and counsel, I would surely have ruined it all long ago. Therefore, do I invoke thee? How gladly do I desire to yield and consecrate my heart, 
and my mouth to this ministry. I desire to teach the congregation. I desire to ever to learn and keep thy word my constant companion and to meditate thereupon earnestly. Use me as thy instrument in thy service. Only do not thou forsake me, for if I am left to myself, I will certainly bring it all to destruction. It, I will. So, you know, that prayer is literally something that helps me lay down my need for your approval and pick up my desire to, prove, to approve or to please God and win his approval. How about you? You have some things in your background that can cause you to have an unhealthy longing for the approval of others instead of God. Please don't get me wrong. It is not exactly healthy to not care at all about what people think. You know, kind of like the t-shirt slogan, uh, warning, I can only please one person a day. Today's not your day. Tomorrow doesn't look good either, right? Of course, often our young people pick this up to the extreme. And their egos explode so much in this area where they decide they are just going to be violently opposed to ever considering the feelings of others as opposed to going their own way and doing their own thing. That is obviously the extreme on the other side that God does not want us to go down either. But today, talking about the opposite. This desire to win the approval of other people that consumes us so much that we're willing at times to lay down the approval of God. You may not even realize it's happening, but I guarantee you there's others in your life that will see it happening. So let's do a little self-diagnosis this morning. I'm going to ask, or I'm going to lead you to ask four questions for yourself to see if you might have a problem here, or you're living too much out of the approval of man instead of in the approval of God. So number one, do you occasionally or often worry about what people think. For instance, you ever post something on social media and go back every 12 seconds to see if somebody commented? Oh, oh did they comment? Did they like what I put on? Is it okay? Am I all right? Did, so, did I get a retweet? Oh, my day is made. Somebody retweet. Can you say selfie? Selfie from another angle? Selfie from a wide angle? Please comment on my selfie. Please love me. Please like me. Enough said. Number two, are you overly sensitive to what people say or think? For instance, I could have 50 of you walk out there, shake my hand, say, oh, great sermon, Pastor. I really think that's going to affect me and help me and motivate me to change my life. But if one of you goes out and says, oh, I'm still offended by what you said last week about taking offense, Man, I'm a failure. I'm no good. I should resign. That's why it's nice to pray Martin Luther's sacristy prayer. I already know that without God, I'm nothing. I already know that left to myself, I will bring it all to destruction. So I can lay those worries at the altar and know that if I testify to the truth and led people to see Jesus, then I am approved by God, and it doesn't matter what you say or think. I'm preaching to please him, not you. The Apostle Paul instructed me, do your best to present yourself to the congregation as approved. See where it says that? I want to be presented to God as approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed or who correct, and who correctly handles the word of truth. That's what I'm trying to do to the best of my ability. Well, how about you? Are you a little sensitive to what people might say or think? If somebody leaves a negative comment on fake book or Coopersville informed? Are you devastated? Are you ready to go to war? If nobody compliments you on your great new outfit, are you crushed? If somebody doesn't return your text or instant message instantly, are you filled with fear? What did I say wrong? What did I do? Aren't we BFFs anymore? Do I need to call? Do I need to text again? <sighs> Lay it down, folks. Third question. See if you are living for the approval of others versus the approval of God. Are you willing to compromise what you know is right just to make somebody else happy? 
You're a young girl and you love God and you want to honor God with your purity and save yourself for your husband to give him that great gift one day of your purity, but you're dating a guy who says, I love you, baby. I love you, baby. I love you, baby. And if you love me, you'll love me the way I want you to love me. And before you know it, before you realize it, you've compromised who God wants you to be or somebody who's going to dump you in two weeks and go on another conquest. Maybe you're a young man and you want to honor God and be pure, but every single one of your guy friends is telling you to get it while you can because that's what guys do. And before you realize it, you've pressured a good girl to become a bad girl and you have compromised who God wants you to be for somebody who you don't even like anymore. In fact, you've begun to hate yourself. Maybe you're older. You want to be established. You your value is to become debt free. You want to be a good steward. You want to manage wisely the resources that God has given you, but you begin to look around at the stuff other people have and slowly but surely you start buying all that stuff too and you end up buying things you don't want or need with money you don't have to impress people you don't even know. You've compromised your values because you want people to like you based on your stuff what you have, or what you look like, your great outfits, or what you drive. And before long, you are so in debt that you couldn't even dream of returning to God the 10% that is His due. And God says, stop all of it. Alter your ego. If there really is no difference between you and the people who don't know God, then maybe you don't know God or trust in Jesus who simply said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Not what the world commands or expects, but what Jesus commands. And I hope somebody's squirming inside right now. I really hope for that. You know, my job is not to please you. I was told at seminary, and it's only been validated year after year after year, my job up here is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And if you were squirming a little bit at this last point, I think we're going to squirm even more with the next question. Do you hesitate to share your faith in Jesus? You believe Jesus is the Son of God, that He transformed lives, transforms lives, and He forgives sins, and He makes us new creations? But you've got a friend who doesn't know that, a friend who's hurting or lost in his sin. You want to share the gospel of Jesus with your friend, but you don't want to be known as that Jesus freak. You're scared that he'll label you and judge you, and it'll put a strain on your relationship, and so you just sit there with your mouth shut, and you let them go to hell because of your sick longing for approval. Folks, it's really time for us to get over all that. Lay it down at the altar of God and be altered by Him. Because let me give you a clue. If you take a stand for Jesus, if you take any stand for Jesus in this world, the world will not approve of you. Deal with it. Jesus put it this way, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Of course, we're seeing that all over. As the world accuses Christians of being haters and judgmental and narrow-minded, all the while hating and judging and refusing to consider the possibility that maybe we're right about God and His Word. Recently, the state of Kentucky succumbed to the pressure of groups that hate Christ and declared that the Ark Encounter will no longer be eligible to receive a tax rebate program that was promised to them when they made that declaration to build that life-size ark and start bringing millions of dollars worth of new tax dollars into the state. So they created new and arbitrary conditions, the state of Kentucky. Uh, in order to be part of the program, Ark Encounter would have to uh, begin to hire, uh, not, they couldn't hire on the basis of Christian faith. In other words, they'd have to hire atheists and people who hate the project. That would really continue to bless their ministry. And, speaking of their mystery, 
they would not be allowed to preach Jesus Christ. They would not be allowed to proselytize or give a gospel message in order to be part of that uh, program. Uh, I think <laughs> what they really want is on that 180 acre site, however big that is, to take a little child's bathtub ark and, and put it on the spot right there so it would justify everybody's fairy tale ideas of what the ark was. But it wouldn't teach the truth and it would never impact anybody's life. And so I guess they'll have to go to court to be treated fairly. Either way, the project's moving forward, still looking for an opening there about 2016. Because what is more important, finally? Winning approval or winning people for Jesus Christ? I've, uh, I'm sure, shared this clip with you before from Bruce Almighty. The movie has been, Bruce has been given the powers of God and misused the powers of God and lost Grace, his girl, which also clearly in the movie represents the grace of God. And now he's trying to force Grace to love him. It's quite pathetic, really. Let's take a look. One more time, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Hi. Hi. I'm uh, doing my first anchor tonight. Oh, wow. That's great. So how have you been doing? Good. Yeah? Yeah, good. Just, um, I, Debbie won the lottery. Oh, yeah? Kidding. But I guess so did 400,000 other people, so she only won like $17 or <laughs> something. I miss you. Okay. I took the first step, jumped out on the ledge. <laughs> Feeling pretty vulnerable, too. I don't know what you want me to say. Just say you love me and you want me back. No, Bruce. Come on. What about all the signs? How did you know about that? Whoa. Okay, you know what, honey? Let's go. Let's go inside. All right, kids, everybody inside. Time to go inside. Grace, please. None of this seems right without you. <sighs> yeah, I gotta go. Wait! Uh, how do you feel now? Lost your mind? What are you drunk? Yeah, I'm drunk. Drunk the tower. Love me. Love me. Love me. Love me. I did. Yeah, I know. Free will. <laughs> Folks, let me give you a clue. If you look like Bruce, you might have a problem with winning people's approval here. You know, if God himself doesn't mess with free will, if God does not force his love on everybody, who are we to think that we can or should? Being obsessed with what people think about you, is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. And it's to completely lose the grace of God, which can only be freely given, never forced. Instead, Paul gave us the model for our ministry to the world. We speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts we never use flattery, didn't put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. Your need to please is a disease. Live for God's approval, not man's. And by the way, if we had to get that on our own, 
we'd be even more screwed up than you know, we are going around looking for people's approval. God is a perfect standard. On our own, we could never win His approval. But when you stand in faith in Jesus Christ, your story, the story of your life is completely rewritten. I just want to close this message in this series today by telling you, it does not matter what people say about you. It does not matter what your own self-talk has said about you. It matters what God says about you, and this is what God says. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. God says if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. God says God made Him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. God says we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. God says we are His masterpiece. God says you are the light of the world like a city and a mountain glowing in the night for all to see. God says those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. God says we are heirs. God says we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. God says he, that you are among those called to belong to Jesus Christ. Not the world, but Jesus. And then in one of the most quoted verses of the Bible, God says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't be altered by this world. Be altered by God. And of course, Romans 12, 1 makes Romans 12, 2 possible. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, sorry, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Let go of your ego and lay all of it at the altar of God and pick up a new life in Christ. I love how Craig Groeschel finishes his book, Alter Ego. He writes, if you want to move your ego out of the way and live by your alter ego, then you must be a servant of Christ. You know that no matter what others say, they can't stop you. They can threaten you, intimidate you, beat you up, lock you up, but your faith will not waver. Why? Because you must obey God rather than people. You're no longer who you thought you were. You are now who you were meant to be. Let us pray. Father, we ask that your Spirit would do a healing work in our souls. It's so easy for us to catch the disease to please others. God, help us to be people who live to please you and you alone. With your help, we truly want to live for an audience of one. So we ask that the Holy Spirit would convict us daily, even hourly, when we're being sucked into living for the approval of others. God, forgive us for that idolatry. Help us to know and believe that we have already your approval because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus laid over the top of our lives. And God, help us to do life and minister to others with that bold confidence, to do it based on who you say we are, how you see us, bringing glory to you, O oh God, in everything we do. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes our ability even to understand it, Keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.